The next speaker will be uh, Tom Black. If he hasn't, is this the word? Yes. Now, Tom is the president of the Landowners Association of Ontario. And some of us who live in the towns are not so aware of the problems encountered by the rural community. Uh, those problems amount to legislated trespass, the annexation of land and so on. And in this regard, the OLA has had a number of successes in reversing the decisions made by councils. So Tom will talk about the origin, the purpose and some of the successes of the Ontario Landowners Association. Because one of the, the facets of today's meeting is to bring together these four groups with this common interest. If we can all stick together, we can succeed together and the council can stop bugging us and other people can stop bugging the farmers. So, Tom. Thank you very much. Um, as you know, uh, he called me the president of the Ontario Landowners Association and uh, I've been in that job for a little while now. Jack McLaren was before me and he's now an MVP and Randy Hillary before that. So um, it's uh, been, we've been out there since 2003, which uh, seems like a long ways back now. And uh, we were a pretty naive bunch of people when we started out. And uh, some days we're still pretty naive. And uh, people sneak up and bite us and we're not looking. Uh, but uh, the real reason we got started was because of everything you heard in this room today so far. Is sort of an abusive process by the people we elect to govern us. And a lot of that time uh, happens because uh, the bureaucracy is actually doing the governing instead of the people we elect to govern us. Partly because they've been there all along, and, and partly because uh, politicians have a hard time getting up to speed with all the stuff that's going on. And uh, with the number of regulations and such going on in the province, Nobody can ever possibly know all the laws there are out there to, uh, to look at. And uh, at one point in time, uh, the Harper government said they were going to reduce a bylaw every time they added one. And uh, Mr. Trump in the States uh, promised that this year, last year, that he reduced one for every one he uh, created. But uh, in a release last week, he said he reduced 22 for every one he created. So we need our politicians up here to take that sort of attitude, reducing those regulations, that red tape, uh, you know, that helps us get on with our lives and not be hampered by those regulations. But uh, for a lot of the years we've, uh, boy, that gets real loud here. Look down. <laughs> a lot of the years, you know, we uh, we were trying to the blame game, and uh, one party is doing this to us, and the other party is doing that to us, and. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you get right down to it, there's not a whole lot of difference in some of these parties. And I heard, uh, you know, we're talking about Quartha Lakes and uh, the amalgamation. Well, that was brought on by the PCs under Mr. Uh, Harris, and uh, then driven home by Mr. McGinney and his crew. And uh, now, as we don't seem to have any friends in Toronto. There's, uh, there's nobody to turn to for that kind of fix it. You know, it'll stand up and present our case. And uh, Jack uh, has been in that position, as you know, Jack McLaren, and, uh, and had to step out of the, out, out of the foray with the uh, PCs because he couldn't take any more of being whipped to vote a certain way for the party. So the, uh, I know that we're all trying to fix the local, and the local is where the road hits the road. But whenever Toronto is pulling the strings, it creates the position you're in in the locals. It makes it really tough to control the locals. We went from, uh, with amalgamation, we reduced, we went, we tripled the costs and reduced our representation by 10 times. Yeah. You know, democracy was lost. We can't, in the city of Ottawa, we can't go in and talk to our council. We've got to go to a, a committee meeting and hope they will deliver the message. 
Whereas the, other, the old way, we'd walk to the mayor's door or the reeve's door and knock on the door and give me eye to eye, you know you're going to get an answer. It may not be what you want, but you're going to get an answer. Uh, so that democracy was lost with amalgamation. The costs are gone through the roof. Our service is no better. There's, there's nothing to be gained here except the loss of our real rights, our personal rights and freedoms. Now we've been, uh, we are always been promoting property rights. You know, people don't understand when we put up a back off government sign. It says, you know, no trespassing, back off government. That is, that is our way of telling the government, you gotta obey the law just like we do. Whenever we, whenever you step onto somebody else's property, somebody's going to come up with a badge and knock on your head and say, buddy, you're trespassing, and we'll arrest you. When the municipality comes and does that, there's nobody to call, because the police are all under the offices of the municipality or the province. So there's, there's this conflict of representation. We don't have any representation as individuals. So uh, for many years now we've been <clears throat> trying to align with parties and that's why Randy joined the PCs. He thought we could change it from the inside out. And uh, Jack followed suit and Jack really pissed him off because he took out Norm Sterling, you know, 31 years as a politician and their, their prime man, he, he knocked him off his seat and they've never really forgiven him. The back room boys and girls, <clears throat> be careful. <laughs> um, they, they've never forgiven them, and never forgiven the landowners for helping them do that. And uh, so uh, we were shopping around pretty seriously for some way of starting up uh, a party to compete against that uh, situation that, you know, and trying to get some government back in Toronto that represent the little guy on the street. So we were shopping pretty hard for that uh, because we had given up on the PC uh, party at that time. And then along came Patrick Brown. <laughs> and he promised us the world. He promises open nominations, remove the old boys club, you know, free 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 open votes, and no open votes except on finances. Just Five or six absolute promises he's going to fix this stuff. End of the Green Energy Act. You know, all that stuff. No carbon tax. Yeah. No carbon tax. <laughs> However, uh, he solicited us, so we didn't go look for him. And uh, <clears throat> we, uh, he brought this great story that he was going to be the savior of uh, the PC party and bring it back to be a representative of us. The real, the real people in the world, the working people, the rurals and uh, the small towns. And of course, uh, I flew around uh, the country with him, Jack did too, and uh, a little by airplane that was bouncing all over in a snowstorm. <coughs> and uh, we got him elected. We, uh, we were a uh, party of getting elected for, nom for the nomination. <coughs> and uh, at which point in time, uh, he disappeared from our radar. <laughs> and uh, that was the last we heard of Packard pretty well. So, uh, and all of a sudden he is spouting uh, carbon tax, you know, and uh, green energy, we have to look after this. And uh, now the minimum wage, he said, we're not going to do what the Liberals did, but we're just going to do the same thing, but just a little slower. You know, it'll take a year longer to do it. So he, uh, he hasn't really voted on anything that, uh, that was different than what the Liberals and the NDP have done. So my question is, is there any democracy in a country <coughs> where the NDP represent the left, pretty much the left side. The Liberals have moved over to shadow that, and the PCs have moved over to completely shadow both of them. Where is the democracy? Where is the other, where is the other voice? We need a voice in there. If there's no opposition, there is no democracy. Democracies are built on people that have a, 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 an opposition in, in a house, where they're voting against stuff. So that's where we ended up uh, looking for somebody else to help us uh, start a party. We met with a lot of parties. There's a lot of small parties out there. And um, we eventually ended up uh, talking to Bob Yasek, who had, uh, had, had learned this lesson before we had. He, he started that like three years before that. He had come to the end of his line with the uh, PC party and started his own party on his own. And that's a tough job, by the way, if anybody's ever tried to start one of those. 
<laughs> I'll let Bob tell you for that one. But uh, so uh, we had uh, we had a couple of meetings with Bob and uh, thought we had a lot of things in common. Bob was uh, fairly receptive to uh, us helping him create uh, a new party and and build it from the ground up. That was the whole mantra of the system. And so we're here today, uh, basically to hope we can join all the ragtag. Uh, I guess we call them the basket of, of <laughs> disruption. The portables. The there you go. <laughs> yeah, so you make jokes that you can't remember. <laughs> so, so that's sort of where, uh, where we're at today. And you guys, uh, I hear all the, the same laments here today, all the problems we have in the rural and, and the small towns. And it's, it's, it, it is local. But it starts in Toronto because they tell you on their official plans and their official policies and all that stuff what they want you to do. And then the little bureaucrats down on the ground say, oh, we got to do what the province said. There, let's get out of here. And uh, so eventually there's not going to be any rural. That's the plan, of course, because they're taking all the schools out of here. There's so too many kids here today, you know, because they're, they're pulling all the schools out of the system where you know, nobody, nowhere to, nobody's going to move to a community where there isn't a school. When they were breaking this country open, the first thing they built, you know, was the army and then the school. You know, they had that was somewhere to train the kids. So uh, the, uh, the the roundabout way of getting where I'm going is that we're here today to hopefully solve the idea that we can get people to vote in this next election for a trillion candidate. I mean, it'd be even nicer if we had some of you folks stand up and become one of those candidates because we don't have one in this area. And I think uh, Mr. Lee would be a good candidate. <laughs> and uh, I know she has uh, other things she's doing here, but uh, this is an important one. <laughs> and, we, and we need two bitches in Toronto. <laughs> I have no worries about that. That's your problem. <laughs> You're gonna have to answer that one. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I, I really would like to to uh, take a, a second look at what we're trying to do here. It's not. Uh, it's ground up. It's completely ground up. Um, I, uh, Jack, I hope will read you off the principles uh, that we are uh, exposing, espousing for this party and what we built it around, and it's about us, the people, not about the government and the rest of us. So the, the problem, like I said, is government control over everything we own. When you own a, a car, you figure you own it. You go to the door and they open the key and you get in and you drive away. And uh, if somebody came and stole that car, the police would come down the road and they would chase it down and, and bring it back to you. But when they come on your property and you say, I own it, you can't steal it, you can't take it, it's a different story. Nobody defends that. And uh, so they come on with their pipelines and their hydro lines and their roadways and they just take an old piece or they take a wetland and they designate a piece. And that designation is just the same as reaching in your pocket and taking that chunk of money right out of your, your pocket and your grandkids' pockets because uh, a wetland designation or any of those major designations is an 80% drop in value in most cases. 80%. We've had many people do the evaluation tell us that stuff. So it's, yeah. You, you with me? No? Okay. And uh, so we really have to be uh, really diligent on uh, making sure they don't do that at every turn. And the only way you can do that, you need a government that has some sympathy for you in the, in the office in Toronto. And if, if we don't have a government doing that, we, need, we at least need a group of people in there that will stand up and be a big, loud voice that makes sure if they don't get attention in the, in the house, they at least get it in the media and bring a focus on that. Most people in Toronto and in the cities and stuff, they don't have anything to take away from them anymore. Everything's being taken from those properties. So now they just reach in their hand and walk and pay taxes from them. But in, in the country, there's still room for them to designate and grab stuff. 
And uh, we need to stop that before it's all gone. There's nothing left, uh, you know, once, once they've designated the property, it's gone. It's, it's virtually a, a useless piece of property. We had a case out in, uh, in Nova Scotia that, uh, that was fulfilled last uh, in November. It came to finality. And in this case, it's called the Lynch case, it was Lynch versus uh, St. John's. Uh, St. John's, the city of St. John's decided they would designate this man's property a wellhead area because they wanted to keep the water good for the city. And so they designated his whole property a water source wellhead area. And he said, well, you're going to do that. You've got to compensate me. You know, you're taking all my rights away. They said, no, 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 you know, there's nothing there that says we have to do that. And so uh, it went on for a few years. Finally, uh, him and uh, a few pretty smart lawyers decided that they would uh, ask for for a permit to do a development on that piece of property. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, he didn't want to do a development necessarily, but he needed to have them say no. A real hard no, you can't do that. And so uh, when they said no, you definitely can't do a development on that property. It's a wetland and it's a designated wellhead. He then took them to court and uh, went to uh, lower court, then to superior court of Newfoundland, of, uh, and he won. And, uh, and they sent it ahead to the Supreme Court. And they looked at it and they said, no, it was done right, it stands. So they won, he won because the judge said they removed every piece of value from his property by putting that designation on there. Now, if you only steal a little piece and you still own it, they don't consider that taking your property. They consider that you own it, so it's all yours. You, you, you own that piece of property. It's, it's all good. We just own this little piece over here. They don't give you anything for it. They don't give you compensation. Uh, but anyways, in this case, he wanted, he, doesn't, he wanted a development on the whole property. They said no. He took it to court. And the judge said, that's a constructive expropriation. expropriation. Those big words. <laughs> we'll help you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyways, um, and that's just to sort of highlight what I'm talking about when I say they designate you and they take it all. And there's no way of fighting that back except in a courthouse. And uh, this costs a lot of money to go to court. Our politicians are supposed to be protecting that. Uh, those are all written in our laws, in the old laws. It's all there. And uh, there's no reason for a politician not to defend that right. And uh, and and who do we say that? They don't want to do that because all the conservation authorities and all all those other uh, greenies all have an issue, all have a a mandate to control your property in their acts. And they raise hell with the green people. So we uh, we need to have politicians in our country to stand up and do that for us. Uh, 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 that was a, an excellent overview of the OLA and why we have it, and and of some of its successes, which is which is always good news when we fight back and we actually win. Uh, now our next speaker is uh, Elizabeth Marshall somewhere. Can I ask a question before this starts? Yeah. You said there's a question and answer too. At the end, we can do whatever we want, or is it? At the end. At the end, okay. Okay, now, um, Liz Marshall is, is the author of this book, and uh, I, I have read good chunks of it. It is the handbook on your rights to property, and we typically think in terms of the rural community, but it also applies to us in a city when the people sort of march under our property and tack those meters to the size of our houses. So uh, this, I think, will be uh, a very interesting talk. And uh, I recommend this is an interesting book. And you'll find all sorts of peripheral knowledge about the long history, right back to the Crown, and the Crown rights and the rights of patent. And one interesting thing is if any of you want to know where the word sheriff came from, <laughs> you, you'll find it in here. Hi, everybody.
everybody. My name is Elizabeth Marshall. Uh, a lot of people know me as Liz. Um, uh, I have to apologize. I have an extremely bad cold. And I started having a coughing fit, which I had earlier on poor Faye. And that's why I highballed it out of here so quickly. Um, I may start having a coughing fit. I will highball it out the door again. And I've got to deal with Bob Yashik that he will run up here and entertain you <laughs> while I'm outside. <laughs> no, he'll leave his clothes on. No. <laughs> That's <laughs> <laughs> so, those who don't know me, I am the Director of Research for the Ontario Landowners Association, and I have been with the Landowners Association for over nine years. And actually, it was a friend of my father's who asked me to join the landowners but he foolishly said to me, Liz, we don't have property rights in the Constitution. Now that went against everything my mother and father had taught me. So I made it my mission to prove anybody who says that wrong. And I have done that successfully time and time and time again. I have taken on lawyers. I have taken on the staffers. I have t over 20 reports written on various pieces of legislation. I have two municipal councillors guides because I can tell you right now um, two things. One, new councillors, when they get the new municipal councillors guide, actually the 2010 one sucked. It told them they had to listen to staff. So I did a huge municipal councillor's guide and I explained to them, wait just a cotton pick and minute your councillors, staff doesn't tell you what to do and you have to uphold the law. Well, lo and behold, after the 2014 election, municipal affairs came up with a new revised municipal councillor's guide and lo and behold, when you read section three now, councillors as lawmakers, Oh, they're told that they have to respect the Constitution and the Criminal Code and so on and so on and so on, which they have never been told before. But the problem is a lot of counselors aren't going to read those counselors' guides. So then they go down for orientation in Toronto when they get elected. Some of them do, some of them don't even bother. And they are told by the Ministry of Municipal Affairs, listen to staff. But you're not allowed to receive legal advice from staff. So how can any CAO or clerk tell counselors legal advice? Every bylaw is legal advice, is it not? Do the counselors know this? So you have someone who is not trained in law, who is not a legal counsel, presenting bylaws that municipal counselors are signing their names to. That's what you have going on. So it's a complete failure of law. And then when you get into Queen's Park, this is the crazy part. So when they write legislation in Queen's Park, they have what's referred to as explanatory notes. Well, those explanatory notes are supposed to break down what's in the pieces of legislation and explain in layman's terms to whomever is reading this bill before it's passed, what these sections are supposed to be saying. Well, I can tell you right now, and I have the proof, those explanatory notes aren't explaining poop to anybody. They are actually misleading our elected officials. In Bill 68, they did an amendment to the Municipal Act, and they included Section 97.1. In the explanatory notes, it states, this is for the conservation of the environment and water. <coughs> so every MPP is going to go, oh, oh, we're going to save the environment and some water. Let's do it. 97.1 in the Act is for green roofs on new construction to sustain vegetation. That's what 97.1 is. All right. So when the 
municipality starts getting this, the staff is going to go, oh my goodness gracious, we have section 97.1. And it says they may create bylaws for green roofs. But we all know that staff will be able to get more money if they have to increase the dollar amount of the construction of new buildings. So everything is going to need a green roof because it increased minimum $35,000 on that property to put in a green roof. And that's how they want to sustain the environment and water because if you have a roof that sustains vegetation, well, you're going to have to get yourself a goat and a ladder to cut the grass on the roof. Safe ladder? <laughs> hey, don't knock it. I just uh, I posted an article on Facebook the other night. You said ladder, right? There is a ladder law in Ontario. And this is because of the College of Trades. And you actually have to go online if you are using a ladder. If you are working with a ladder, you have to go online and pay $29 to get a license to tell you how to use that ladder. It's on my Facebook page. As of 2016, we have 380,000 regulations in this province. The building code regulation is 867 pages long. You would not believe how many regulations there are out there. By the way, somebody mentioned to me, and somebody said, well, ask for the question later, but I'm going to spill it out now. Okay, so they're telling some people mandatory sewer hookup. Is that right? Water and sewer. Okay. Y'all folks, get a pen and a paper out because you need to get Ontario Regulation 322 backslash 12. It has to be with the consent of the property owner. It's in the regulation. Well, then give that number again, Liz. Ontario Regulation 322 backslash 12, and it's under the Municipal Act. <coughs> and it's with the consent of the owner. It's right in that regulation. So can I clarify, that means they can't come on their property unless the owner gives them permission to do so. You got it, So they can't force them to hook up. That's right. If they do force them to hook up, yeah. if they do, which they did in some cases in Oakland, um, if they do force them to hook up, who pays the bill? That's the same. We pay. pay. Yeah. pay. Yeah. No, listen, listen. Yeah. No, because they should have informed you. They are to know and understand the law. And they are not to abuse you because you don't know and understand the law. So sue their butts off. Under section 448.2, subsection 2, based on the fact that they didn't explain to you and so they were operating in bad faith. Listen guys, this is important here. This is going to affect a lot of people. Look, okay, so the Municipal Act is 380, 400 pages long, okay? <coughs> The Municipal Act was originally, in, for Upper Canada, was created in 1841. Since 1841, all the way up to the present Act, it clearly states in the Municipal Act they have absolutely no control over anyone's private property. And all you have to do is read sections 10 and 11, which is subsection 10 is for lower tier, section 11 is for upper tier, Subsection 2, which is bylaws, saying the municipality may pass bylaws for the following things. Paragraph 4 of subsection 2 states that they may acquire the public asset to exercise their authority under the Municipal Act or any other act. So if they haven't acquired the public asset, which is land equipment or other goods, they cannot exercise their authority. It's in black and white. Like even under section 23, and that's another section you can go after them about the sewers, they may enter into an agreement with a private property owner for sewer, water, or roads. It's all in the legislation. 
And I've been doing this for nine years, so I know what's there. Same with under the Planning Act, <clears throat> Section 25. You know all these official plans? Under Section 25, they may acquire the land to develop any feature of an official plan. Because those official plans are supposed to be for future infrastructure and roads and so on and so forth. Under Section 28, community improvement. Do you know what the definition of community improvement is? This is the big burner for everybody in the room. It's any planning, replanning, any division or subdivision, yada, 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 social housing. It's all there. Under 28 subsection 3, they may acquire the land for any community improvement, which includes any planning or replanning. And then when you get into zoning, you go down to section 28 subsection 10. So after they've acquired it, after they've developed it, and I mean like done the grading, put the roads in, the street lights, built their buildings, whatever. Under section 28 subsection 10, they can then go to section 34 that they beat you all up with and they can zone it. And then they can sell it to whoever is going to use it and there will be a covenant registered. That's how it's all supposed to work. I have a 200-page report on planning. I went back to 1946. I read through the legislative debates. Because we need that information. We're being destroyed out here by our government. Because they keep building more and more and more legislation and more and more and more regulation. We don't need that. Like for me, like because I read this stuff, Omnibuses. Does everybody know what an omnibus is in here? <laughs> it's a piece of legislation that is created to amend umpteen different pieces of other legislation. And it may even create a new piece of legislation. Bill 68 was an omnibus. It amended 19 pieces of legislation. That, that was a reasonably small omnibus. I have seen pieces of legislation, omnibuses, that amend 40, 50 pieces of legislation. I even... But. I just want to say when they vote, do they have to vote yes or no to that one omnibus bill? Mm -hmm. So that's why, so you can agree with something and disagree with another, still have to vote one Yeah, way. but the thing is, though, if there's something bad in it, you vote against it, period. Because there is nothing, there is nothing that can alleviate the moral obligation of the person that you elect, if that elected person is going, well, you know what, this isn't so bad, so, you know, but this is really, really, really bad, but I really want this. Well, guess what? If that is really, really, really bad, like Bill 139, well, Bill 139, it was just all bad, period. But you know what? The Conservatives voted in favor of it. Why? Because they got their nose planted with the conservation authorities. Yeah. They do. So they wanted Bill 139 to go forward. And it makes the conservation authorities overlords. They think they have more of the century. There's no such thing as more of the century. It violates the criminal code and it violates the Constitution. Done. Yes, Timber. Refresh people's minds on what 139 was. Bill 139 is to repeal the Ontario Municipal Board, to create the new planning tribunal, which by the way will be bureaucrats, and they are planners. And by the way, because everybody voted in favor of Bill 122, the, blank, the planners are now protected. If you are not a certified planner, you cannot challenge a planner. And then, they also created the tribunal, the planning tribunal um, uh, information center. But only certain classes of people can actually use that information center. And then you get into the conservation authority section of it and made them overlords. That's what Bill 139 is all about. That's, that's Reader's Digest, very Reader's Digest. That's this is what I mean. And these people...
people, we're electing them to say no to this stuff. <laughs> and, and that is the biggest problem. And I'm, I'm really actually going to be beating up on the conservatives because I feel very betrayed. Okay? All of this started with Bill Davis. The removal of all of your private property rights started with Bill Davis in 1973. And I have the proof. And it's called the Niagara Scarborough Planning and Development Act and the Parkway Belt Plan. And they were told by the Liberals and the NDP when they were in government, you are stealing the land and the wealth from the people with doing this. And they said, well, we're not taking their land, we're just not going to let them use it the way they want to. <laughs> we don't care if we devalue it. And actually, it was really funny, because the NDP brought forward the fact that they were devaluing land by up to 600%. And they did it, and they went forward with it anyways. And as soon as they did that, and this is a quote from the legislative debates in 1974, if you put in that Niagara Scarborough Planning Development Act and the Parkway Belt, you can do that anywhere in the province. You can take people's wealth and property from them. Well, I have beaten the Niagara Scarborough Planning and Development Act. I did a 147-page report, and I proved it, that they cannot lawfully do this. We just didn't know that back in 1974. Was it recently? No, it's still there. You have to elect people to do that for you. And that's the problem. So as far as I'm concerned right now, because the Liberals didn't repeal it, the NDP didn't repeal it, so they're all the same and they're all to blame. And when you start going through the legislative debates and you see how these people are voting, you should be thoroughly disgusted in them. Like Jack McLaren brought forward a bill in the House called the Bob Mackey Bill to repeal the Niagara Scarborough Planning and Development Act. He had his ass handed to him by the PC caucus. And the whole thing is, Jack was the only one that stood up in the House and voted for the Bob Mackey Bill to repeal the Niagara Scarborough Planning and Development Act. Laurie Scott ripped his face off Sylvia Jones, she did a number on him. Bill Walker, he did a number on him. Like, they have absolutely no concept that every time they pass a piece of legislation like this, they're actually destroying their own properties too. And that's because of the whipped vote. And that's why I'm with the trillion party. Can you see anybody trying to whip me? <laughs> I'm on Facebook now, and I've been just pounding out the information like nine, as much as I can. And there are people out there that say, oh my god, Liz, you're just splitting the vote and Kathleen Wynne's going to get back in. First and foremost, Patrick Brown and the PCs are worse than Kathleen Wynne. You have to go through the votes. And you have to go through their 139 policies to see that. Even Tom Adams, I think you've heard of him about electricity on the news, Tom Adams. He's saying the PC policy on electricity is worse than Kathleen Wynne's. So this is the whole thing. I've been through the policies, and I'm shaking my head. So as it stands right now with the Fair Hydro Plan, which, by the way, I phoned in to committee on to accuse government of violating their fiduciary duty, meaning they are violating or in breach of your trust because they're a violation of the Electricity Act. But this is the whole thing. The Financial Accountability Officer states that if we don't have a balanced budget, that debt just for the fair hydro plan, for you guys to get the discount for three years, that's gonna cost you, your children, and grandchildren up to $93 billion. 
I've read the reports. So for three years, you're going, woohoo, I got cheaper electricity. A fourth year is going to come along and it is going to bite you. And they all know this. You should have seen the votes. So Andrea Horwith, she brought forth a pretty good bill. And the PCs voted with the Liberals against it to stop the increase in electricity pricing back in 2015. So then, what's Patrick Brown do when he gets in as leader? He writes this bill so scathingly ignorant, dragging in the NDP and the Liberals, as in cahoots and collusion, that of course the NDP aren't going to vote with him. They all want you to have to pay through the nose for your hydro. Because they have deals done. They've got Samsung Korea Consortium. And, okay, in 2013, I have a letter to the editor on the back table back there. A girl found a document on Vic Bedelli, who is a PC MPP. They knew in 2013, A, we had a surplus of power, B, that Samsung and Korea Consortium were in default of the contract that they had signed in 2010. And, it would save us $5.2 billion if we did not enter into a new agreement with them. The PCs knew it, the NDP knew it, and the Liberals knew it. We didn't know about it, did you? The recommendation was there. And they went forward with <clears throat> the amended agreement of 2013. I have all of these contracts. But we had an election in 2014. How many liberals would have voted for another party had they known about that agreement? Why didn't the PCs and the NDP tell all of you about this deal? Who wanted to lose the election or who wanted to win? Tim Hudak came out with the 100,000 jobs, but they didn't tell you about a contract that should not have been entered into in the first place. You see, this is why I am being betrayed by the people that I have voted for loyally for years. You know, being a member of the Canadian Justice Review Board, I have stayed nonpartisan since I was elected to the Board of Directors of that entity. And I have finally stepped forward and I am running for the Trillium Party because of the fact that I know that if I disagree with Bob Yassick, if I feel that if anyone in our party is bringing forward a bill that is unconstitutional, violates the criminal code, harms the people of this province, or is just bad literature, yeah. there is nothing in this world that can make me vote in favor of that bill. We got Jack, he's a sitting MPP. Bob's a candidate in his right. We got Lonnie Harrington back there. We got John Grant, we got Andre. We have three or four guys here, and they are running. We have how many confirmed? What, 27, Bob? Uh, over 30. Okay. We need candidates, we need volunteers, <clears throat> and we need money. I'm gonna be crass, and that's the long and the short of it. It's 10 bucks for a membership. And that's all it's going to need. But we need all kinds of you to help us to do this. You want me in Queen's Park? Help me. Because sure as shoot, I'm getting kind of worn out. It's been nine years of me running around the province trying to put out all these little fires. Let's try to get us into Queen's Park so I can take on the big fire. As far as I'm concerned, the Attorney General's got a great big red target on him right now with me because of all of this stuff that's going through. And my first bill is going to be, there can be no more omnibus bills unless it's the budget, period.
Um, I better get off of here. So thank you very much. Hey, I didn't talk.